another opening, another show. That's what these lights always make me think of. And uh, you'll already have twigged that I momentarily exhibited an inability to listen carefully to the instructions that were given just a, a minute or so to, ago to me. My name is Michelle Thompson, MP, and I'm MSP rather, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here and welcome you to, first of all, to this 2023 Festival of Politics. It's its 19th year, and it seems to go from strength to strength, and is a really valuable part of what the Parliament does, bringing, bringing the politics in and spreading the politics out. I'm the convener of the cross-party group in this parliament on music and one, I'm extremely passionate about music and two, I'm a former musician myself and indeed so is everyone else in my family. So the importance of what we are going to discuss this evening is absolutely vital. But first of all, let's meet our panellists and I think as traditional, we will go from left to right and we'll go from ladies first. Are we allowed to say that nowadays? Not well, sure. You just did. So. I just did. I just did. So <laughs> Beverly Whitrick is the Chief Operating Officer of the Music Venue Trust. And that's a charity created to protect, secure and improve grassroots music across the UK. Now, if you don't know Hamish Hawk, you should. If you haven't listened to Hamish Hawk, you should a critically acclaimed singer-songwriter from our very own place here in Edinburgh, off the back of a UK sellout tour and top five album chart positions. So I'll be looking for your autograph at the end of this, I have to say. And last but no means least is Jim Frailing. And this is an important addition to the panel as well as an experienced business leader in sports, music and events. And I think you're going to be able to provide a very unique insight on some of the matters we're going to discuss today. Now, I will lead off with some questions to the panellists and we will cover a number of areas. Please do take notes and there will be an opportunity for you all to ask questions as well and that's very important. And when you come to that bit, I'll indicate it and you put your hand up, I'll pick somebody and I will try and get as many people in as possible. Okay, so starting off though, I think we'll start with yourself. Okay. People are claiming that this is the best year ever in terms of output and particularly for grassroots venue. Is yep. that true? If so, why? If not, why not? Sort of is my answer. <laughs> um, anyone who's a real gig goer and you know will know that you've got loads of tickets that were backed up from sort of postponed shows, and I've got loads of mates who've forgotten about shows, and there was a big backlog. And the question last year was, how much will that be sustained this year? Um, the numbers for last year are large. Um, so the actual money generated by live music events last year was bigger than in 2019. So that would suggest that we've come back from COVID quite well, albeit it was achieved with slightly fewer shows. Um, and so what that says, and I, I should credit a guy called Will Page, who is um, a really good uh, data guy in live music and used to work for Spotify, used to work for PRS and he wrote a really good article on Music Business uh, World uh, which is a, a good trade publication that went through these numbers and it basically just said that in 2022 we ended up at 42,000 events generating about 2 billion quid, I think that's right, um, and whereas 2019 was 1.7 uh, done from 56,000 events. So fewer events generating more and a bigger bias towards the high end of the spectrum where I used to work in, in terms of, st or still work, sorry, I'm not completely out of it, but uh, stadiums and arenas, um, Bev can talk much better to grassroots, but the numbers suggest that it's come back, and like Will's article was basically like, we've, we've absolutely nailed this, everyone's mm -hmm. done brilliantly. And that's sort of true at the high end. Okay, and that's an important point, and I was going to come to you next, Beverly, to get your insights on the grassroots perspective. Yeah, things are not so rosy there, unfortunately. Um, it's, there's a real contrast at the moment between the public facing messaging about the music industry as a whole, which is very much saying, you know, best year ever, more great shows, festivals are doing really well. And for the industry as a whole, that's true, partly because ticket prices are much, much higher than they've been. And there are some real showcase tours. You know, we've, we've read about Taylor Swift selling tickets for next year or Beyonce doing a massive show. Big names that, that go all across the UK to arenas or do big open air shows. However, 
where things are really struggling is at grassroots music level um, and in our grassroots music venues across the UK, so Scotland equal to England, Wales and Northern Ireland, there are fewer shows, there are lo lower audience levels and venues are really struggling and in fact having worked very hard in all the nations to ensure that venues mostly made it through COVID, we're actually losing a grassroots music venue in the UK at a rate of one a week at the moment. Yeah. And is, is that the reason why you've set up the trust? Well, we set up the trust a few years ago because we were worried about venues closing mm. and there was definitely a trend. And so we're actually nine years into the work. And ironically, in 2019, we'd reached a point where it looked like the work that we'd put in and gathering venues together as a Music Venues Alliance was starting to pay off because at the end of 2019, for the first time, we had more opening than closing venues. Then, of course, COVID hit and during the pandemic, things got very tough, but it's actually tougher now for venues. And so, thank goodness we were established in 2014 and already gathered our network and sort of started to have the messaging and create statistics because you know that nothing speaks louder than facts and figures and in fact I'm going to wave these around we have some of these we, pu we published our first annual report at the beginning of this year for the figures for 2022 and that showed some really worrying trends like the fact that grassroots music venues have a prof profit margin of 0.2 percent so they're investing yeah. an extraordinary amount but it's costing more and more we actually think that profit margin is going to be eroded by the time we produce and that the report. report's online isn't it this report is online yeah, yeah. and there's some copies here if anyone would like yeah. to yeah. have a copy and so hamish what's your perspective and that of your peers if you can it's i mean it's a it's a difficult question to answer simply because from a personal perspective there's absolutely no doubt that post pandemic there is a new a sort of renewed energy and vigor sort of in audiences coming to gigs and saying to us at the merch table or saying to us after the show, oh, it's so great to see live music again. And there's, you can't help but feel invigorated by that because me and a lot of my peers during the pandemic, and it was the same across lots of industries and lots of fields, it was a sort of, it felt like either it could be some kind of death knell for the entire industry, but on, for artists on a personal level, they didn't know what was going to happen. You know, there was absolutely no knowing whether you'd come out the other end of it. So there is definitely a, a sort of, a certain optimism and a willingness to engage on the part of audiences when, uh, certainly when I see them on the road at uh, grassroots venues. And the, the audience engagement in terms of ticket sales has been, has been incredible for, um, and I only speak from a personal perspective, but um, whilst I've been touring over the past couple of years, and it's maybe about four or five tours in that time, it's, um, yeah, the engagement has really been astounding. That said, backstage in the green room and when you're talking to the people who are, who are these venues, who are absolutely vital, the, the sort of lifeblood of the entire outfit as it were it's a it's a really different story and it's actually quite it's quite difficult to be optimistic in the face of that they're really really struggling grassroots venues on a national level are operating on a 0.2 percent profit margin 0.2 percent mm -hmm. so it's just a knife edge yeah and there's it's it's going to take a huge amount of sort of concerted effort to improve that situation or even just to keep it as it is, it's, it's a really perilous situation. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds that, and, and all of you are clearly articulating the issues around the current cost of living crisis and that stat about a 0.2% margin in the, the level of inflation we have is utterly staggering. So we all understand that's a huge challenge, but is it the only challenge that we've got? I notice we've not yet touched on the kind of ecosystem of of the infrastructure, right? and I'm interested in. We understand that's a challenge, but what else might other people not be aware of as a challenge? Well, I mean, even before the current situation, it, it like venues. I, I'll talk, I'll come at this from a venue perspective because it's what I know best, and they're hard to run, they're hard to build, and they're hard to make money from, even at arena and stadium level. So, not 0.2% hard, but you know, that 
they only really work when you get all the other bits aligned with it. So, and we'll talk about this hopefully a bit later, but the, when private operators get involved, you know, they want to have the ticketing, they want to have the sponsorship, they want to have the venues around it because the actual core bit of business that is a venue, um, they're not actually very good at making money in and of themselves. What they're brilliant at is stimulating all the area around them. Um, so if you put an arena into a town that's a new arena, you know, it, it will stimulate the nighttime economy. And we've seen that. It, mm. We know that works. But it doesn't make them any easier to build because unless you do the sort of walled garden bit of keeping everything together, the finances don't stack up. And that was, so it was already hard. It's got harder. And then with the cost of living, what you're then seeing, and it's classic. I used to work at Wembley Stadium and years ago, 2008 sort of credit crunch time, what you saw was with the, the ticket prices that there were, we used, there used to typically be about five or six in the stadium. At the top end stayed okay, the cheapest stayed okay, but the mid market just gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. And you see that in the ticket categories, in hospitality, in general business as well. And that's happening again now. Mm -hmm. So an already difficult business has got harder, which is fine, people adapt. But that is where I think we could all be a bit smarter certainly in terms of how we work with government and I think what the Music Venue Trust has done in terms of engaging with governments and just banging the drum better has been great kind of the rest of the industry needs to do a bit of that as well mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing actually to be in a parliament building and be here because most of the time we just get ignored so well, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen the Scottish Parliament. And you, you've touched on, on quite a few uh, themes there that I think we're going to go on and explore further. Yeah. The, the kind of GVA, the gross value added of music and venues, yeah. uh, the appetite of uh, politicians at whatever appropriate level. But we'll stay in the theme. Have we captured all the challenges, Beverly? Is it really worse? We, there will be a bit where we cheer everyone up, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I think what, what I would add about the grassroots music venue sector that is different to larger scale venues is the ownership model. And it's something you and I have spoken about before, Michelle, where 93% of grassroots music venues operate in buildings with a private landlord. And that means that they're also subject to the vagaries of the property market. And that makes it even more challenging and um, length of lease is also an issue when you come to looking at your business model and your economic sustainability as well as your environmental sustainability and you know issues like that the average lease length in our sector is I think 18 months left on a lease which gives you no real ability to plan for the future so while you're looking at the bills at the moment and you know the current difficult situation you're adding that element to it. And we, we have had some success in this. Last year, we came up to Scotland and we launched the Own Our Venues scheme, which is a pilot scheme to collectively buy, start buying grassroots music venues. And in fact, we have one <laughs> Glasgow venue in the um, original cohort of nine venues that we we're crowdfunding for, the Glad Cafe is part of that project. Mm -hmm. And collectively, we did raise £2.5 million and the purchases of buildings have started. But when you consider that there are around 900 grassroots music venues in the UK, that could be a very long process to secure them and make them more financially secure with a benevolent landlord that ensures those buildings stay as venues. Because at the moment, what we see is some landlords will just look at a grassroots music venue and go, actually, you're a really terrible tenant. And if I don't renew your lease, I'll be able to use this building for something else, mm. which obviously doesn't really happen at an arena because they're purpose built and less often at mid-level, although yeah. obviously mid-level is slightly mm. more precarious. Yeah. And this is a huge area. And again, I think people can read more about what you're trying to achieve with the purchase of these venues on your website, can't they? There. Shameless plug for you. Great advert, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> musicvenuetrust.com. Thank yeah. you, Michelle. Uh -huh. And so, Hamish, <laughs> we've covered off some challenges, but one of the things that's been of interest to me is the extent to which, beyond the, the cost of living crisis that is flowing into everything, that Brexit's also been a challenge mm. for, and that's something that we've not kind of covered yet. What's your perspective from a performing musician? You know, certainly as an independent musician. So essentially what I'm, I'm speaking as an unsigned musician, 
someone who, uh, and my band, I speak for my band as well, obviously, we're trying to do things off our own backs for the most part. And since Brexit, the costs of touring in Europe, I mean, we were talking earlier about the, the sort of percentage increase in how much it might cost to tour Europe hypothetically. And it's somewhere in the region of 25%. And that might sound negligible, but when you consider the... Not on a 0.2% margin well, level, no, exactly. it definitely does not. <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> but when you consider uh, the overheads for, for touring ordinarily, mm -hmm. it's the difference between being able to tour and not being able to tour. And you start seeing, you know, if I may address a sort of greater philosophical point for me, I, I and Beverly and I were discussing this earlier on, something that I, I'm aware of is there seems to be a, a sort of difference between what is popularly understood of how musicians tend to operate and what the music industry really looks like. And there's a kind of world of what the industry looks like. And then there's the reality of how musicians actually earn their crust. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge, they're just two completely different realities. And so to be able to tour at all and make a profit is, is difficult enough in this country. Mm -hmm. to, to then add the, the, the increased regulation and the red tape surrounding touring in Europe these days, to, bands are simply not able to do it and they're not going abroad anymore. And there's something, you hear quite a lot of lip service being paid to the cultural exports of the UK um, or of Scotland and the UK this sort of, oh, we're so proud of our musical heritage and it's the Sex Pistols and, oh, remember back in the 60s where it was all these bands. It's just not, we don't live in that world anymore. And the amount of support is, that is being given to bands to be able to export this music, it's just not there. And so, uh, unsurprisingly, European festivals are now opting for very few um, Scottish or uh, British bands to come and represent um, the British Isles, it just, and it's a loss for us. And so when I say I'm addressing a wider philosophical point, I want to address that there needs to be more value placed on these exports in people's minds. It's, it's not merely a financial value, although it is a colossal financial value. Mm -hmm. It is, it's so much greater than that, and we're losing it so quickly, it's, it's quite frightening to me anyway. Mm -hmm. And staying on you then, we are here today in the, the Scottish Parliament. What do you think specifically that the Scottish Government can do to help assist matters? And I'll, I'll ask you all that, but staying in yourself, Amish. Now, um, well, for me personally, I must say Creative Scotland is, is an incredible asset. And it comes down to of giving more towards that Creative Scotland budget. The things that uh, sort of um, my contemporaries have been able to do thanks to Creative Scotland, it's amazing. And uh, I, I am personally so grateful to them for allowing me to record some of my albums. And um, I think it, it comes down to investing more greatly in Creative Scotland. And you use an interesting term there that I must admit we did chat about earlier, seeing that as an investment spend yes. rather than subsidy. Exactly. That's a way of thinking about it. And so what's your thoughts, Beverly, having dealt with both governments at UK level and at Scottish level? What more can the Scottish government do? Um, I think there's a really interesting continuation of the idea of investment, but it's not necessarily about asking Scottish government for money. It's more about adding a voice and guiding a concept about who should be responsible for the future of music in Scotland. And on that, we're doing a lot of work at the moment, looking at models around the world and looking at the French model and saying, well, there are really admirable things about that, but we don't think it's right for the UK because what happens in France is that music is taxed in order to create a pot of money to reinvest in future music development. However, what it goes to development-wise is not necessarily the sort of music that generates the money. And, and what we'd really like to see and what we're talking to governments across the UK about is encouraging the music industry to look at its own research and development and to invest in 
artist development, venue development, you know, the future of where their arena and stadium headliners will come from. And we believe that government can be a really powerful voice in that of saying, you know, most, in most industries invest in research and development. Cultural industries, not so much. There's sort of this assumption that all of the UK is a world leader in culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, music is particularly strong in, obviously Scottish music is known the world over. But other countries are investing in the future of their music and their music exports, as Hamish said. And the level in the UK is low because there seems to be, in some quarters, and absolutely not yours, but in some political quarters, a sort of thing of, oh, culture will be fine. And culture won't be fine on its own. It needs direction, it needs championing, and it needs support. So one of the things that, the concepts that we're talking about a lot is a venue levy where the more successful bits of the music industry, the bits that we kind of started with, reinvest some of that profit from the big tours, the big gigs, back in grassroots artists, grassroots venues, the places that will help develop the future headliners. Mm -hmm. And that just doesn't exist in the UK at the moment. And you've touched on a really interesting theme that I'm going to open up, that, that sort of virtuous cycle of what the music industry itself can be doing to understand that you need to bring people in at the grassroots level to furnish these venues because we all succeed from each other. So have you got some additional thoughts to add about that, Jim? A few. Um, there's, I think we need to look at how government generally interacts with the industry in terms of the tax rates, but certainly relative to Europe. So, you know, we pay more VAT, we pay, um, you know, higher, higher taxes, I think, as venues and as artists and as, than most other European countries. So mm -hmm. probably need to have a look there. And can I jump in there? Yeah. Have any conversations been had? Because obviously that's a, a purely uh, reserved responsibility of the UK government about a variation of yeah, that. Yeah, it, it was, I think there was through live, um, which is the sort of overarching body, uh, it, there was relief in COVID times, mm -hmm. um, but it's just gone back up. Uh, then yeah, PRS, which is basically a tax on live events, which goes back to the songwriters, which is not a bad thing, but mm -hmm. eats into things. Licensing and planning are huge areas because it's really hard to get um, license issues resolved. Music venue trust talk rightly about things like agent of change. That applies the principle of, you know, if you move into somewhere and there's already a venue there, if you complain, it was there. You know, so the thing that was there first should get recognition of being there first rather than I buy a flat opposite night and day in Manchester and then I get to complain about it, you know, which has been a fairly notorious case going on for a while, things like that. But, but you know, just little things like we, we tax, if, if you, if there's lots of venue owners here, they sell a pint of beer, they're taxed on it far more than a supermarket, right? And you think what happens with that system is that, and it's the same for pubs, I used to work in the brewery sector, uh, we're just incentivising what all the kids do now, which is to get loaded up, pre-loading at home, mm -hmm. and then have one or two drinks when they go to the venue. Why, why, when pubs and music venues are such an important part of who we are, do we incentivise that and incentivise supermarkets over the actual venues themselves? Why do we tax one, the same product, mm -hmm. way more in one than the other? It is literally chalk and cheese, and it's been going like that all the way through. Mm -hmm. So you're like, you know, one is a communal experience that binds people together, and we don't have many of those like big experiences that make us as a society now, because all the things that used to do that a bit more, a lot of them have just fallen away. And that, that like organised religion is much less a part of our lives. I'm not arguing for that, but I'm just saying those <laughs> things have sort of fallen away a bit. So why do we incentivise people to drink at home, mm -hmm. and then all the problems that go with that? Why? Do, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me. So yeah. there's lots, but it's and also you know just at the right time listening and engaging with people. So there might be a particular venue that's under threat or struggling, and it might be that a developer somewhere else wants to build something but has a basement space they don't really know what to mm -hmm. do with. The venue that's struggling with stupid rent and low margins might suit that space there, and there's, that has happened occasionally, but we know that that works and, can, and is a good model. So there's models that are out there already. There's councils through, through um, throughout England, throughout the UK, that have actually said we want a nighttime economy and gone and invested in venues. Mm -hmm. And they've got the GVA to prove it. You know, you look at how vibrant Leeds is, 
you look at Cardiff, which has got a stadium, a small arena existing and is building an arena, they're doing it because they know it works. You know, mm. so there are models for sort of that public sector cooperation mm. that can happen. They're there. We just need to bring them out a bit more. And you've articulated so clearly the complexity in all <laughs> these different parts that, 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 yeah. that pull together. But I suppose my question to you, Hamish, is what more can the industry itself be doing as well as government? We've had a thread earlier from from Beverly as to what government could do and, and some some good suggestions about the industry. But for, again, from your perspective, as a performer, what would you like to see more of from the industry itself? Well, I think that's the thing. I mean, what Jim was uh, pointing at in my mind was essentially there seems to be a kind of, there seems to be the grassroots level and then this sort of other level, this sort of stadiums and arenas. And they seem to be treated as two completely separate entities, but they are, one will sustain the other. And it could be this cycle, this mm -hmm. really, that could be, well, I think it seems, it almost seems, well, we say that word investment, mm -hmm. you know, it's an investment in the future. And I think it could really be quite a beautiful thing if you had, say, you know, if you had, say, a certain percentage of every ticket sale from every stadium or arena show, a certain percentage of that going in to sustain the grassroots level. And I could speak as someone who performs in grassroots venues. I know that's something that bands would support. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, I know that it's something that people who actually perform on these stages it's exactly the kind of, whether it's we were talking about Coldplay earlier on I know that I could I could assume quite comfortably that members of Coldplay would be quite up for that sort of thing well that's well <laughs> <laughs> I have heard myself to say that <laughs> we wrote an open letter to them and they haven't responded yet oh. well there you go that's <laughs> I, I can in my role as convener can issue that call to Coldplay please respond to Beverly's uh, letter but staying on this theme, uh, and you've touched, Beverly, on what happens uh, over, overseas, uh, we, have you got models where you've seen it being done right? And what impact does that have through some of the threads that we've talked on today? I think it's quite hard to find a perfect model mm -hmm. because obviously there's an intention that sometimes when it progresses doesn't go quite the way you might have thought it would. Um, there are definitely some really interesting models in Europe. And it's a really interesting time to be looking at Europe because certainly Westminster don't want to hear anything about Europe. So that's tricky because we have a long relationship with similar organisations to ours in European countries and, and you know we know about their own research and there's a lot more subsidy for grassroots venues because it's understood that grassroots artists rely on grassroots venues that just doesn't exist in the UK at all. I think the attitude in the UK is much more free market. You know, well, well somebody will open a venue if one closes and of course that's becoming much more difficult to do. I think the, um, the sort of cultural funding sector is a really interesting one because you've always got to sort of say, well, what's inside the envelope and what's outside the envelope? And Hamish talked about Creative Scotland and we, we worked really closely with them during the pandemic and absolutely got the support where it needed to go, which was great. But the history of cultural funding in the UK is kind of a tricky one because there's always the sort of high arts or traditional arts that when push comes to shove, they kind of claim more of a call on the funding because traditionally, they've needed the support. So you often get people saying, well, opera's really expensive. Of course it needs all the funding. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, opera is really expensive, but a big rock show could be really expensive as well. And you don't expect that to get any subsidy at all. So th there's interesting models where, as I say in France, that there's a great model from the point of view that 3.5% of the profits then goes into a pot and you can apply for money if you think what you're doing may not break even. And that's really great. But we know that some of that money from the big pop and rock shows ends up supporting opera. And so I think there's a thing of looking around everywhere. I mean, some of our work started with models in Canada and Australia. And, you know, we work closely with, with Neva now in America. And it's that bit of taking what looks good, but also being a little bit aware of what doesn't quite work and trying to come up with your own version of what's right for the UK, because there's always a certain amount of adaptation. 
But what I do know at the moment is an awful lot of countries are actively investing in musicians and what they need to develop in a way that the UK is quite behind because of the unique challenges we have in the UK at the moment. Yeah, um, so let's uh, open that up. And I want to come to your, yourself now, uh, Jim. I, I agree with what you're saying, Beverly. My experience when, when I was training was that people imagined that I spent my day saying, darling, I feel a symphony coming on. They had no idea about the rigor and the discipline and the complexity and so on. And to be honest, I, I, I see that, that, that general ignorance permeating many elements of society. But investment in something, this is a term that we keep coming back to. So, Jim, I'm interested in your view for investors and following on from a financial perspective, this concept of an ecosystem. What do you see as the opportunities for investors and what are the challenges? And you talked about high end, low end, but yeah. what are the opportunities similarly to way, the way we would treat any other sector by creating a, a market, if you like? Yeah, well, I don't want to, I mean, um, Beverly will talk about it doesn't actually take that much to sort of really sort out the, the grassroots. And from my perspective with like arenas and stadia, they're, they're hard to build, you know, they are, they're not great buildings in economic, pure economic terms. You know, you're better off building a, a care home or something like that really these days than you are building a music venue. Um, but there is an opportunity and I'm, I'm right now engaged in a, in a scheme in England where I'm trying to get a proposed, uh, not small, medium sized arena off the ground. And we've finally got buy-in from the council. We've got buy-in from a group of developers. We think we have funding, but getting it to planning is the real challenge. So there's two real stages that are hard. It's the initial bit, then there's getting it to planning. And I know there was a proposal. I saw one for a proposal, an arena around Edinburgh near Lothian that was, and they were quoting more money than this, but I reckon it would take about a million, two million quid to get to planning. Um, that's quite hard because no one really wants to come in at that stage. They'll come in after when you've got planning and the site and everything else, but not at that bit. So I think there is a role to look at some kind of co-investment or seed funding or something that's, that pays back better because you're coming in at a, a high, higher risk stage. But, you know, it's an investment, not a subsidy. So you should, if you're coming in at a higher risk mm -hmm. stage, you should get bigger rewards later. That sort of thing. And we're looking there in that one with a regional mayor at whether they could come in at that point and do exactly that kind of thing, a shareholding which gets rewarded better than the people who come in later. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a potential role there. Um, it's a bit of a dirty word in England at the minute because there's so many councils that have lost hideous amounts of money with betting on property and are going bust. So you need to be careful Woking. about Woking being <laughs> the classic example yeah. um, where their brick to brick company um, I, I don't understand it, but they got it really wrong. Yeah. Um, so there are councils that have taken on an entrepreneurial view. So it's a really bad moment to go to councils and talk about that, but we're doing it. Yeah. Um, but that kind of thing might work. Yeah. So I can see a role there for, at that level, long-term yeah. patient capital, because, yeah. uh, you know, many companies, have, pension companies in particular, mm. have seen so many risks where yeah. they previously would have bet on a bank and, you know, who would yeah. bet in a bank now, nowadays. Uh, yeah, OK, right, so carrying on then, what does government need to do to persuade the live industry to invest? Uh, and how well are they persuading government? So... How well are... Sorry, can I... How well uh, is the industry persuading government and what does government need to do? I... It's a difficult question in that I genuinely, I think, I don't want to necessarily return to what I was saying earlier, but I think there is a, not a misunderstanding exactly, but as well, a non-understanding of how the industry really works mm -hmm. yep. and how, and what it means for the people who participate in it. For example, we were talking about um, the difference between classical music and popular music, say. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of tax relief that you get for being an orchestra and a traveling orchestra. Um, and it's, yeah, the or orchestral tax relief you can, you can apply for. And it's for non-amplified sound for groups of people over 12. <laughs> now, with a band, you might have five people on the stage. You might have five, four people on the stage. So if but, you did acoustic, 
Oh, you twelve. And of had more than twelve of you. <laughs> yeah. Then you might apply for orchestral tax. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but if you're a band, you might have five people on the stage. But you'll have a sound engineer because yeah. it's amplified sound, and you yeah. might well have a lighting engineer, and you'll have staff at the venue, and you'll have you know management and promotional teams and PR and all sorts. That you know, I speak as someone who, you know, I I play under my own name, and my band is my name essentially. But there's a whole team of people behind me, and the cost for us to, you know, whether it's just you know, uh, hiring a van, paying for the fuel, hiring of equipment, then there's obviously the, the travel itself, accommodation, food on top of that, paying the session fees for the musicians. You've got, and that's just, that's before you even your, leave. Your rider. Of course, the rider, yeah. that's the, yeah, the Bollinger. And the, <laughs> you know, not, not. Um, but there's, it's, it's so much more and, and this, you know, there is no musician at my level that I could say pays themselves. It just doesn't happen. It's just not feasible. You know, I, I've been on tour, as I say, four or five times in the past couple of years. And me, my guitarist and my drummer, we're essentially sort of a company within the band. We don't pay ourselves. The band makes enough money just to continue its own operations and in the hope that someday that balance might tip and that we might be able maybe <laughs> once to pay ourselves a minimum wage once, once a, one month, you know. That's no, the I, hope. I promised we were going to che like, cheer everyone up. No, but it's <laughs> a, it sounds, it, honestly, I, I, this is what I mean by the, the reality being so different mm -hmm. to what is popularly understood is because, and obviously I understand there's people in this audience who know exactly what I'm talking about, but it's, it sounds perverse, mm -hmm. but it's not. The only, you know, it's just yesterday, in fact, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a Scottish Album of the Year award winner, award winning singer songwriter, critically acclaimed singer songwriter. Many of you will know who this person is. And we were discussing how it is on a weekly basis that you have to reckon with yourself as a musician. My passion for this job how much meaning it affords my life, how much it means to me to be able to write a song, play it, tour it, have people come up to me and say, I heard that song when I was going through A, B or C, my mum heard that song, my brother heard that song, he shared it with me, blah, blah, blah. How much that means to me and how, how truly, I can't even put it into words how much that means to me to be able to experience that. You have to, rec you have to put that against how you are not able to sustain yourself at all on the money that you might make from, from it. And this, this song, singer songwriter was saying, listen, I've got a daughter and a dog and a flat and a life. And I, I, can't, I can't budge. I've got no, there's nothing and there's no support. And it's just, as I say, what's popularly understood, and it's not even uncommon that people might think this, this sort of, you see this sort of mystical thing on stage because that's what, that's what theatre is. You know, that's what these performances do. They're absolutely magical. We've probably all been to a, to a gig at some point in our lives and had that kind of tra transportive experience where you go, oh my God, I don't, you don't even understand what's happening on the stage because it's, it's not, you know, it could happen down here, but if it happens up here, it's something else entirely. And we've all had those experiences. And so we, tr we put musicians in this other place and imagine them as this kind of idealized version of, oh, I'm sure they're fine singing. You know, they're, or, you know, they might be the tortured artists, but they might be able to, you know, rub two pennies together to get some food. Mm. But it's just not like that. And I, you know, this last tour I did in February, talking to Jim earlier on about this, the capacities of the venues around about 600, 700. And I'm absolutely astounded and so privileged to be able to play venues like that and to have the tickets sell out. It's just the, it's the stuff of my life. It's amazing. But there's no profit from that. Mm -hmm. That isn't how that works. <laughs> and to other, to people, when you talk to people about this, they say to me at gigs, they say, oh, I can't believe you're selling your own merch. 
And I'm saying, who do you think is selling my <laughs> Who do you think who's going to sell my merchandise? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's not, you know, when we say that the system is broken. It's not a, it's not a system. A system mm -hmm. functions in some sense. Well, we have an ecosystem. Wait, but it's not, that, a, not a fully functioning no, ecosystem. Exactly. And I, I, obviously, I speak as a musician, but I, if I may, as you know, I can't speak on behalf of the MVT, but this, is, this, this extends to venue staff and to venues themselves. It's, it's almost like local governments and, and the British government are just hoping to some sense they can keep this in the background and not really think mm -hmm. about it too much and continue, as I say, to pay certain lip service to this incredible musical heritage that the UK has. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, that, that was at a point where it was, well, we don't live in that world anymore. Yeah. And, I, it's, I, and I think, I mean, I, I'm so humbled listening to you talking so passionately uh, about uh, what you do and particularly the meaning yeah. within music, which I think we haven't really touched on, but that's, that's how it gets us and grabs us here. And I think that's probably a good time to allow the audience to come in with some questions. Now, the staff here have got some roving mics. So if you could pop your, your hand up. Oh, excellent, we've got a gentleman here. See, Matan. Yeah, great. Uh, there's a couple of people uh, today on the panel who've mentioned um, alcohol and what that has got to do with um, venues. Um, it's pretty clear that most venues hope to be able to pay for the entertainment on stage from the ticket sales and where that doesn't work or we have to pay all the other bills. Essentially, all of Scotland's music venues right up to Barrowlands and above. And I mean, you know, Jim can talk about what, Wem what, what alcohol sales mean to Wembley. But, you know, the, if you weren't a big pub doing music, essentially, whatever the size, Wembley size, you, w you wouldn't be around anymore. And the market trend is that people are drinking less. It's been a premium premiumization trend for about 15 years where people are spending more on each drink, but they're having far fewer of them. And that's turning, in, in some cases, into, well, they're spending less money, or they're not buying lots of tickets, but they're spending big money when they buy a ticket, and that's where we see the arenas do particularly well. But in Scotland in particular, where, you know, we had the potential ban of alcohol advertising, etc., and Scottish government isn't in, isn't in favour of people drinking more, they'd probably like people to drink less. Where's the worth funding going to come from for venues in the longer term when we continue to see, as Scottish government would like to see, a decline in alcohol sales? Jim, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's, that, is, that is the model that existed, that, you know, what you take over the bar is vital at any, any size of the um, of venue that you've got. And it was important at Wembley, just as it is, at, you know, a, a grassroots music venue. Um, what I would say, if I was the government to that, is, yes, it's important that people drink less. And the trends that you're seeing are that there are more people who don't drink um, as well as people drinking less. And if that's the case, then... You get fewer antisocial issues and you get fewer incidents if people are drinking in a more relaxed manner and if you can serve food. So if you're with friends, and I think you know, pubs and venues are more of a moderation on behaviour than people getting tanked up at home and then coming in and standing and doing what they, in the trade is called vertical drinking, where you're, you're in a place that you can't sit down, you can't get food, and you might have a few shots and it's a bit more leery, you know? So... If, from a health perspective, I would argue that music venues can be a positive influence. So even if people drink less, it can be done in a more sociable way and potentially with a food bit, which just means that people don't get as tanked up and it's better. So I would argue the case, therefore, that I think music venues can play a positive role in changing that behaviour, whilst acknowledging it is a massive, massive part of the venue's P&L to be able to sell alcohol and make money from it. And Beverly, I wanted to bring you in here because you mentioned the Glad Cafe mm -hmm. in the south side of Glasgow, which is a very, very well-known and vibrant venue. How are they approaching this challenge? I mean, I think the Glad is a great example of a community venue that, that, yes, it puts gigs on, but it does lots of other things as well. And for some venues, in fact, their daytime activity, the cafe, the food and drink that they sell, absolutely is what underpins their ability to put artists on in the evening. Um, not every venue is set up like that. Not every venue has that um, position in the local community. I mean, I would say the vast majority of grassroots music venues do have a community around them, but not all of them have the ability to have a kitchen, to serve food, 
and it's a re it's a really interesting idea that that you know everyone could develop that but the nature of a lot of our venues being in non-designed music spaces means that you know it, well, I mean, next venue, it's a hundred cap standing space venue. There's not even a dressing room, let alone a restaurant space. And yet it's a thriving music venue because he's found a way to make that work. There is no one size fits all. But I, what I would say is the example that, that Nick's given of alcohol sales decreasing and, and, you know, thankfully, younger generation drinking less is an even greater argument for the grassroots levy from the more successful bits of the industry that have the higher ticket prices and that are making a profit to reinvest back in the grassroots. Because at the moment, in the 2022 stats in our report, Scottish venues invested £8 million in artist development and development of new work. If their profits decrease, if it becomes even more tenuous than the 0.2%, they're going to have less money to support the artists to develop those communities to to give those opportunities for the artists to connect with audiences which you know is what live music is all about and so we're going to need that money to come from somewhere else and for decades now it's been assumed that the beer sales will do it and as that changes it just strengthens the arguments that we need to look at other models mm, thank you can i take the next question uh, gentleman at the back thank you <coughs> Um, one thing I've, <clears throat> I'm keen to, well, one thing I'm disappointed that you've missed out, and it's a major key factor in the actual grassroots industry, and <clears throat> possibly the backbone of the grassroots industry, and that's the actual promoters. Having been a promoter myself, I, I mean, pff, the hard work that goes into it, and the frustration working with a venue, the, the type of venues that you're actually talking about, is, you know, it's, it's disappointing you've not actually picked it up. Thank you. Uh, and is there anyone in particular you'd like to pick up that question? Um, well, anyone that, that could pick up on it. Uh -huh. I think we all understand the importance of uh, promoters, and it's probably it's just not factoring in conversation. Hamish, do you want to come in at this well, point? Well, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, <laughs> that's um, when I, you know, when I've spoken about, I've tried. I, I usually, especially when I'm performing and when I'm when I'm discussing these things, you know, on radio. Um, or in press, one of the things, as I mentioned, because I perform under my own name, there's this assumption that there's this one man island thing. And I would be absolutely nowhere without my promoters, without my agents, without all of these people. So yeah, no, do apologize, but I couldn't, I couldn't agree more in that there's, it's not, it's so much, there's a, an entire network here that is suffering and it's not just, yeah. Beverly, do you want to add to that? Yeah, we're called Music Venue Trust. So we always talk more about venues. Obviously, an awful lot of venues have in-house promoters as well as working with external promoters. So apologies, it's kind of a given that a promoter is part of that. But part of what we would really like to see, because we think it would help explain what Hamish is talking about a lot, is I really think that there's an argument that gigs should have credits. Because when we go to the cinema, if you stay and watch the credits, you see how many people are involved in the production of that film. And OK, that's a finished piece of work, whereas obviously every live performance is unique that time. But if people had any idea of the number of people responsible for bringing that gig to them that night, they see who's on stage. They may be aware of a lighting and sound engineer, but they probably don't know that an artist has a manager and an agent and that a promoter has been involved as well. And that, you know, all the other people that are involved in that continuum in that ecosystem have brought that gig to them. And so I think we've got a certain amount of education to do in the UK about speaking more about this mystical thing, the music industry, and the fact that the artists on the stage are representing all of these other people behind the scenes that are so key to that as well. And the, the, the skills that are required, you know, to get cut through in difficult financial times. OK, let's let's move on. Who else have we got for a question? Gentleman there, uh, T-shirt. Yeah, you mentioned uh, how the Glad Cafe get on, like, it's uh, 
and that is an example of like what is seen as a successful Glasgow music venue. But I mean, I I, I own I, I own a couple of venues, uh, the Hug and Pint in Glasgow. I'm a director at the Voodoo Rooms in Edinburgh. And, I run a promotions company called 432 Presents. We put on 700 gigs last year. Uh, the, I mean, my understanding, uh, I, I promote maybe 10, 20 gigs a year at the Glad Cafe. And my understanding there is this in perma crisis. You know, it's like uh, the, they can't afford to pay their bills. They can't afford to pay their staff. They can't afford to pay anything. It's like, and this is a, it's, this isn't this new thing. This is completely ongoing. And fu- fundamentally, it's like these places, go out of business and then come back as new as new places and probably most of the places that we eat and drink are new limited companies most of the small places that all of us eat and drink are new limited companies after the covid pandemic and the uh it's kind of these places are vulnerable and they aren't supported like the hug and paint doesn't get any funding whatsoever none we present 350 concerts a year the and that's that is the problem you know it's like there is no tax relief and there is no funding and And what would you apart from the the sort of funding because part of the the backdrop to this is a chronic shortage of funding which is being felt at at kind of every level and as you'll know the scottish government operates to a fixed budget it's not even it's got even very limited borrowing powers compared to even local councils for example have you got anything to add to the earlier thread about innovative ideas where the music industry itself, we've had a great one from, from Beverly in terms of uh, a levy, but your thoughts as, as well. I mean, imagine you had a blank check book or you could open locked doors to government. What would you do? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think uh, you've got a lot, we've got a lot to learn when we look at quite advanced football models where we are looking at how we develop talent. And that is focusing really on creating opportunities for young people, very young people, getting rid of the restrictive license and laws associated with live music venues where the live music operators like myself are terrified to let children into the venue in case they drink alcohol. Which they will, of course they will, because they will like we were all like we were all fifteen and sixteen and we were all uh, going through the transition from being a child to being an adult. And but the problem is when those children are on premises and they are drunk they are suddenly a massive glaring problem for us. And even when when we, which we all of us do every time, enforce best practice in that situation, we are still extremely vulnerable. Uh, the So we, we find it very difficult to nurture talent when it really needs to be nurtured. And we are not, and we are not supported to do that. So the default thing to do is not to do it. That, that would benefit everybody. And funneling money in, sorting out the licensing issue and funneling money into supporting young musicians at grassroots venues would be a massive change. Thank you, yes, Jim. Can I, can I just pick up on a point you said about football? Um, I think it's an interesting parallel where it's not, it's so far from perfect, but it exists. Where in football and um, the Football Foundation in England, uh, is funded by a mixture of Sport England, which is the government's sort of um, encouraging sport, Quango, uh, the Premier League and the FA. And they each put, roughly speaking, 8 to 12 million quid a year in. And the net effect of that over 20 years is that grassroots football has benefited to the tune of about a thousand new artificial pitches um, and, and improved facilities at grass pitches, yada, yada, yada. It's not perfect. It was meant to be 5% of the TV money from the Premier League. At, and they did that deal at a time when it was like 140 million a year or something like that. The Premier League now earns about a billion from UK TV and a billion from overseas rights. And if it was truly 5%, they'd be putting 160 million quid a year into grassroots football. They put 12 Um, So it's not perfect, but the model is there and it works. And what happens is industry and government have kind of come together and acknowledged that if we're not going to do it like France, who make it a mandatory provision that every town over a certain size must have a certain amount of leisure provision. So if you ever travel through France and you go to a small town, you will see they have a good tennis court. There's like more than a, I don't know what the number is, it's like 100 people or something. 
but they, they make it mandatory. If, if something's not a mandatory provision for councils, uh, it doesn't happen. Um, but an alternative to that is that football foundation model where it is accepted that the money that pours in at the top ends up a bit at the bottom. It could be so much better and it's not the model to adopt, but the principle's there. Government puts in money, um, the two big organisations put in money and it sort of works. It could be better. But Beverly earlier was talking about getting the right models and adapting them. If we had something like that in music where artists insist on some kind of levy, promoters come together, agents come together, managers come together, venues come together, and there is something that goes to grassroots, it would go an awful long way. Can I just say, the Scottish FA doesn't have as much money <laughs> as they have no. south of the border because we did check. And yeah. They don't have the Premier League TV rights. Exactly, but, yeah. but there is still reinvestment and, and we actually had, we had a great conversation with Scottish FA to you know, find out how it works here and absolutely the clubs do have money that then is invested in local communities and in talent development, just not on the scale yeah. of English It's a really interesting point though in terms of using the models that you've got and improving them. Yeah. When you talk about leisure provision in France and it being a tennis court, there's no... There's no not necessarily an obstacle to that being a cultural provision no. uh, or a similar, you know, a similar model being employed for music venues. Now, it's we're getting to, I'm sorry, I can see you want to come in there, Beverly, but I'm quite aware uh, of time. What I want to do, and it may well incorporate this last theme that we're touching on, is to give each of the panellists just one minute to sum up some of the things that we've covered off today. So I will go back to you now, Beverly, but I'm going to put a, a one o'clock gun uh, a one minute gun rather on and then we'll come to yourself Hamish and finish with you. I mean I, I think actually we've touched on this really important theme that, that culture is a non-statutory provision in the UK and there's this sort of idea that it will happen automatically and we are an amazing cultural nation you know Scotland's music is incredible but it's because of the determination of individuals, not necessarily the fact the infrastructure exists for it to be sustained. And, and that's the concern that we're addressing here. If Scotland's going to continue to have amazing music venues to develop the incredible talent of Scottish artists and connect it with audiences, there needs to be a plan. It can't just be left to the hope that Scotland will continue to be a musical power. That there, there needs to be a strategy. And as Jim said, lots of different players need to be involved. And there's a role for government in trying to help orchestrate that and help facilitate that conversation because Scottish culture is really important. It talks to who we are. Hamish. Your, your big takeaways from our session well, today. I'm conscious that you wanted to, to put a smile on people's faces, but maybe I'm not the guy. Is, um, so, but uh, I think what the judgment was saying is absolutely dead on. This is, this, is an un, this is a continually developing crisis. It's not, it doesn't come and go. There are venues that live on that knife edge perennially, and it goes for artists the same. And it's so long, you know, so long as musicians are having to, to pursue their careers as passion projects, and so long as venues are having to do the same, or this is just something we hope we can cling on to for as long as we can, or as long as, you know, from a, another personal perspective, for as long as Spotify is not a, an income generating thing, it's a promotional tool where people actually engage with their music, but you get 0 0.003 pence per stream. Um, that crisis is go only going to continue to unfold. And I think there needs to be, exactly as Beverly said, governments need to engage with what they're really dealing with, with what this industry is and what it's being built on, because it's, it's being built on sand. And unless there is real concerted effort that goes towards sustaining it, that will allow governments and local authorities to, as I say, to celebrate what they've done in the past and, and to look forward to the future with optimism, then it's, it's really, it's so precarious that it will, it will disappear far quicker than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I, I'm tempted to point out you told a wee porky you said you would cheers up, but <laughs> just to give the last remarks to, uh, to Jim. You're very hard to follow. Um, <laughs> I would say, yeah, I think your point, it, just because it's there, you know, anyone of a political hue here, just because something's there, has been there in the past, doesn't mean it will be in the future. And I think governments at every level can play a really important role, not providing the whole answer. No one wants a subsidy and we're not going to get one, but in bringing a whole sort of portfolio of solutions to the, to the problem. And everyone in the industry, we've all got to have a go at this too. And when this industry comes together and all, it's, it's a weird setup, music especially live music, you know, when you've got artist to manager to agent to promoter to venue and then, you know, production companies in between who we didn't even mention as well. I should have mentioned them. Yeah, it, it is a weird setup, but when it does all come together, it's a very powerful thing. And I think we need to remember that. And if we all have a really good go at it, there's a really good chance we can do something. Um, and if that's a slightly positive note, I've seen it happen. And we've seen models that are out there that work. So we just got to acknowledge them, learn from them and do a bit of work bringing it all together. And something that is currently there, has been there for a long time, could be there and thrive and be a big part of it. But I think we need that recognition because, you know, and things like, I don't want to mention Brexit again, but, you know, we are bigger than the fishing industry. And look how much attention the fishing industry got relative to music and all of that. You know, and that was stupid, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> I think that's going to be the, the <laughs> quote of, of the night. And on that note, I'd like to thank uh, Jim and Hamish and Beverly for their contribution and also uh, for yourselves. Thank you very much for attending this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Now, I'm duty bound to mention that there's a further music related festival event on Friday, the August 25th in conversation with music and artistic director of the Los Angeles Phil, Gustavo Dudamel, who is absolutely brilliant. I've seen him and I do hope you'll be able to join us for that. And I hope you've uh, enjoyed this event and thank you again to the panels. Thank you. Thank you.